Welcome to lecture 5. In this lecture, we will quantify processes where no heat is transferred between the system and the surroundings in order to discuss heat engines. This lecture will be presented in two parts. The first part will focus on adiabatic processes, which are processes where no heat is transferred between the system and the surroundings. In the second part, we will discuss heat engines, which are objects that convert heat to work and vice versa. An adiabatic process occurs when the system is isolated thermally. This means that no heat can transfer in or out of the system. In the context of the first law of thermodynamics, the heat, or Q, is equal to zero. Therefore, when applying the first law of thermodynamics, the change in internal energy is equal to the work. Keep in mind that adiabatic expansions results in changes to the pressure, volume, and temperature. Now that we have determined this direct relationship between work and the change in internal energy, let us quantify the work done by an adiabatic process. Recall that work is defined as the negative of the external pressure times the change in volume. This can be difficult to integrate because the temperature changes in adiabatic processes. However, we can use this to our advantage since work is equivalent to the change in internal energy. Changes in internal energy can be quantified by integrating the heat capacity of a substance at constant volume by small changes in temperature. This means that once the initial and final temperatures are known, this integral can be performed and the amount of work will be determined. The difference between reversible or irreversible processes is that the change in temperature will differ. As you can also see in the figure on the right, that the area under the adiabatic curve would be less than the area under the isothermal curve. This is just one example. It's possible to extract more work from an adiabatic process compared to an isothermal one using different conditions. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that we've always been using Boyle's law, which is this idea that P1V1 is equal to P2V2 to basically describe the relationship between pressure and volume as gases expand and contract. The one thing that you have to remember is that the temperature, it's assumed that the temperature is constant with this. That's what makes Boyle's law hold. And what we just discussed is that adiabatic process um, or expansions, well, they, they don't have constant temperatures. So we can't use Boyle's law to then relate pressure and volume for adiabatic expansions or compressions. And so we just have to just take a step back to be able to then reformulate some of this relationship between these two state variables so that then we can then apply it to solving problems that have to deal with adiabatic expansions or contractions. The process that we're going to follow to come to this relationship is going to draw upon this factor, this idea that work is minus P or the external pressure times a small change in volume and then small changes in the internal energy is just equal to the number of moles times the heat capacity at constant volume times small changes in temperature and the fact that these two quantities for adiabatic processes are equal to each other and this is because Q is equal to zero. And what we're going to end up with is something that actually looks very similar to Boyle's law with a very minor difference but we'll get to that when we actually solve for this problem. At this point though, we're going to continue forward with this small changes in work is equal to small changes in um, internal energy and we're just going to substitute directly into this expression. So minus P external dV is equal to the number of moles times the molar heat capacity at constant volume times dT. And what we're going to assume here is that we're going to be dealing with reversible processes. So that means then for P external, I can then substitute in the number of moles times R times T over V times dV, and that's still equal to NC times dT. At this point, I can cross off the number of moles on both sides, and then all I'm going to do is I'm just going to integrate. So I'm going to have on this side an integral between V initial and V final times minus RT dV over V, and on this other side I'm going to have an integral between T initial and T final of the molar heat capacity at constant volume times dT. And in this case I'm just going to then rearrange just so that I can move this T over here over to the other side. And this is just so that I get an integral where I've got solely as a function of V on one side and solely as a function of T on the other side. So I'm going to have minus R 
integral of dv over v from vi to vf. And on this other side, I'm going to have the molar heat capacity at constant volume, integral ti, tf, dt over t. And so we can we know these integrals pretty intimately, the integral of 1 over v times dv. Well, that's just going to be equal to the natural logarithm of vf over vi. And on the right-hand side, I have the molar heat capacity at constant volume times the natural logarithm of t final over t initial. So now there are two things that I'm going to do in this step. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a substitution for the gas constant, where I know r is equal to the molar heat capacity at constant pressure minus the molar heat capacity at constant volume. And so what that means is that I'm going to be writing in for my R right here, I'm going to be writing in CPM minus CVM. The other thing that I'm going to be doing at this point is I'm going to be taking this minus sign and I'm going to use the natural logarithm um, property where any value that's out front of a natural logarithm becomes the exponent of that. And so if I have a minus 1 out front, then what that means is that I then have a minus 1, or I can use that or interpret that as a minus 1 for the VF over VI. And so what a, an inverse does is it just reverses that order. So I'm just going to write this as VI over VF. On the right-hand side, it's still going to be the molar heat capacity at constant, vol or, yeah, constant volume, and then the natural logarithm of the final temperature over the initial temperature. I'm just going to erase these extra markings, just not to confuse at the very end when you're looking back over this whole thing. But the next thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to divide both sides by the heat capacity at constant volume. And I'm going to write that down into the next step. I'm just going to just subdivide this a little bit, just so that I can use the full page. But when I accomplish that, well, we can see basically on the right-hand side here that dividing both sides, or about dividing both sides by the constant or the heat capacity at constant volume, well, that basically gets rid of the term on the the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, well, I can basically divide it into this term that's in the parentheses, and so then it'll cancel out this term on the right, and then I basically just am left with a ratio with the term on the left. And so what we end up with writing is the heat capacity at constant pressure divided by the heat capacity at constant volume, minus 1, times the natural logarithm of the initial volume over the final volume, and that's equal to the natural logarithm of the final temperature over the initial temperature. Now at this point, I'm just going to define a new constant just to simplify this expression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let gamma be equal to this ratio of molar heat capacities at constant pressure and constant volume. And so that just means I rewrite now this expression as gamma minus 1 natural logarithm of the initial volume over the final volume. And that's equal to the natural logarithm of the, initial, or the final temperature over the initial temperature. And then again, I'm going to reuse the same property that I invoked a little bit earlier, where I have a term that's sitting out in front of a natural logarithm. And so that's the same thing as letting that be the, what's inside the natural logarithm be raised to the exponent of whatever is out front. So then I can write natural logarithm of vi over vf raised to the power of gamma minus 1 is equal to the natural logarithm of t final over t initial. From here, I can just take the exponential of both sides, and what that'll do is that'll get rid of the natural logarithms. And so what I'm going to be left with is vi over vf raised to the power of gamma minus 1, and that's equal to tf over ti. So remember what we were originally going for. We're trying to find a relationship like Boyle's Law to relate the pressure and the volume between two different states in an expansion. Within a single state, though, we can still use the ideal gas law. And this is how I'm going to convert these temperatures on the right-hand side of my expression into pressures and volumes so that then we can get back to a more Boyle's Law type relationship. And so if I write down the ideal gas law and then I solve for the temperature, then I get PV divided by NR. And so then I can then write VI over VF raised to the power of gamma minus 1, and that's equal to, well, the final temperature is equal to the final pressure divided by the, or times the final volume, all divided by the number of moles times R, and this is going to be multiplied by N times R divided by P initial, V initial. And so we can just cancel out 
the n times r and the n times r. And what we're left with is p final v final divided by p initial v initial. And then now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move these, this volume final and this initial volume over to the left-hand side so I can group all the final and initial volumes together. I'm also going to slightly rewrite this expression on the, the, the left-hand side where I'm going to stop writing it in a parenthesis, and I'm just going to write explicitly the initial volume raised to the power of gamma minus 1, and with that I'm going to multiply it by the initial volume, that's the one that I took from over here on the, the, the right-hand side. I'm going to divide that by Vf raised to the power of gamma minus 1 times Vf, which is, again, this Vf that I took from the right-hand side, and that's going to be equal to p final over p initial. And then from here, these are supposed to be dots, not minus signs, but from here what I have on the left-hand side is I have a value raised to the power of gamma minus 1 times a value. And so basically what this vi and this vf that I have here, what that does effectively is it just cancels out these minus 1s. And we could take this akin to, just as a simplified expression, if I have x raised to the power of n minus 1, and I multiply that by x, well, what that gives me is just x to the n, which is because I've basically, by multiplying these two things together, I add the exponents of the numbers with it, and since this is x raised to the 1, n minus 1 plus 1 gets rid of the minus 1 and the plus 1, and just leaves me with the n. And I can use that exact same thing here with my my um, expression that I've been building. And so in the end what we have is vi raised to the power of gamma divided by vf raised to the power of gamma, and that's equal to the final pressure over the initial pressure. And so again, to write this like a Boyle's Law type expression, then what we have is pi vi raised to the power of gamma is equal to pf vf raised to the power of gamma. So the only difference between an adiabatic expansion and then an isothermal expansion, which is what Boyle's Law talks about, is that we have to just raise the volumes that we input into our expression to the power of gamma, where gamma, again, is just this ratio of the heat capacity is a constant pressure and the molar heat capacity a constant volume. 